whenever you guys are ready let me know and we can get started yeah mahesh i think we can start because professor has to leave at sharp 8 so let us uh, start on time and close on time yes sir yes sir uh, so uh, good evening and welcome uh, all for this uh, uh, aps dl i triple aps distinguished lecture on the dawn of uh, multifunction multi shared aperture antenna systems so i welcome you all for this uh, uh, distinguished lecture and i request uh, shri punit mishra to give his opening remarks for this lecture then i'll introduce the speaker then we can get started thank you thank you mahesh so on behalf of ieee apmtt bangalore joint chapter and on my own behalf i would like to welcome uh, professor mohammad s sharawai as well as all the attendees who are virtually joining us for this wonderful distinguished lecture on the dawn of multifunction multi standard shared aperture antenna system and i think uh, this topic is uh, very much relevant to the space systems as well where we are having a crunch of uh, frequency spectrum as well as the real estate issues because we cannot have multiple antennas we cannot have bigger antennas so we have to have a kind of a, if a shared aperture kind of antenna is there so that is going to really help the satellite community because uh, at a given space uh, we can have uh, multi function antennas which can be operating in different bands so this is a very very relevant topic which we are going to have and uh, we are also having a, a very knowledgeable experts with us Uh, so i request each one of you to make this session uh, interactive so that uh, we can learn and uh, don't hesitate in asking questions if but i will request please wait till the end of this presentation uh, you it may so happen that most of your questions are uh, answered in the subsequent slides but still we will have uh, some 5 to 10 minutes of q and a session and with that uh, we will uh, wind up this uh, session so over to you mahesh yeah thank you sir for your opening remarks now well, let me introduce the speaker uh, mohammad desh uh, sharawi is a professor of electrical engineering at polytechnic montreal canada he is also a member of the poly uh, grames research center at polytechnic he was with king fahd university of petroleum and minerals saudi arabia between 2009 to 2018 he founded and directed the antennas and microwave structure design laboratory at kfu pm he was a visiting professor at the intelligent radio laboratory electrical engineering department university of uh, calgary alberta canada during summer fall of 2014 professor sharabi uh, areas of research include multi band printed multiple input multiple output antenna systems reconfigurable and active integrated antennas applied electromagnetics millimeter wave mimo antennas and integrated 4g 5g antennas for various applications dielectric antennas and on package antennas he has more than 380 papers published in referred journals and international conferences 11 book chapters one single authored book entitled printed mimo antenna engineering article 2014 and uh, the lead author of the recent book design and applications of active integrated antennas article 2018 He has 28 issued, granted, and eight pending patents in the United States Patent Office. He is serving as the associate editor of IEEE Antenna Wave Propagation Letters, IEEE Antenna uh, Open Journal Antenna Propagation, and IET Map. He is an area editor uh, for Wiley Microwave and Optical Technology Letters. He served on the technical and organization program committees for several international conferences such as UCAP, APS, IMWS, 5G. AP cap iwat among many others professor sharawi is a member of itpl member benefits committee and the person managing the aps student travel grant he is serving as the u uh, r trap delegate for north america so with this introduction i welcome professor uh, for this talk so kindly take over the session thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr apajapa and thanks uh, dr mishra for the introduction as well as the long biography um so uh, good evening everyone uh, i hope that thank you for for, for joining us for this uh, uh, distinguished lecture talk um so basically um today i'm going to show uh, 
several research areas that have, we have been working on and tackling in the past few years, um, especially with the mindset of having multifunction uh, uh, shared aperture, because um, as everybody knows, the real estate on mobile devices, on, on spacecrafts is always expensive. So we wanna utilize the area or the volume provided in the best way we can. So today I'm gonna show some of the uh, uh, projects and ideas that we have been working on uh, uh, in that direction. So the start of the presentation is going to go as follows. I'm gonna start with, um, with a, a, a highlight of some of the research activities that we are actually conducting within my group at Polytechnique Montreal. Then I'm gonna give um, some kind of trends how are we driven by technology to come up with these novel antenna systems? Then some fundamentals about 5G, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the solutions that uh, my group has been working on in the past uh, half decade, I would say, uh, uh, in this area. So basically just a, a, a quick context about um, um, uh, Polytechnique Montreal. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, to make this uh, as small as possible. Uh -huh. So uh, basically, um, uh, the University of Montreal, Polytechnic Montreal is the School of Engineering uh, at the University of Montreal. It's one of the oldest universities in Canada. Um, we have only engineering departments. So it's, it's the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Montreal. We have, we have around 10,000 students uh, uh, and, and, and one tenth of them are, all, are, are basically in, in the electrical engineering department um, where we have 20% of the population uh, as graduate students. And actually, Polytechnique lies on a very nice hill uh, in Montreal called Mont Royal or Mount Royal. And as you can see here, this is a, uh, a night view uh, in the winter with a little bit of snow. Usually, the snow is, 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 is almost half a meter up to a meter sometimes. So it becomes very hectic in the winter times. Uh, but uh, nothing closes, everything is open no matter how much snow we have. So our research activities actually can be uh, 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 categorized into five areas. So we are developing MIMO antenna systems for various applications, whether we're talking about handsets, base stations, or other applications. We have also worked a lot on sensors and sensors arrays for biomedical oil and gas uh, applications. We have uh, developed a lot of techniques for miniaturization, whether by loading, having uh, 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 metamaterial unit cells, uh, and also we. We've worked on phased arrays, so we've done a lot of uh, antenna arrays for UAVs and UGVs, developed a lot of algorithms for beam and null steering, and also the classical computational electromagnetics, where we have done a lot of work in the theory of characteristic modes and characteristic phase So, just to give you a perspective about some of these applications and some of the designs that we have worked on, so in my mind, uh, uh, multiple input, multiple output uh, uh, antenna systems. Or I will come back to this uh, from a fundamental perspective. Why is MIMO important? MIMO uh, appeared in 4G and it will actually continue in all future generation communication systems. It will never go away because there's a specific advantage uh, 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 from this technology. And this technology comes with the fact that we need to have multiple antennas to have multiple parallel streams coming in and out of the device. So we've worked a lot on reconfigurable, we've worked a lot on reconfigurable uh, based MIMO antenna systems uh, for cognitive radios. Cognitive radios are radios that can switch the frequency bands of operation uh, electronically. So as you can see here, this is one example where we actually develop the circuit models, the way we load the antennas with the active elements. Here we're talking about varactor diodes and how would that affect the frequency band of operation as well as the radiation patterns. So the key is that multi-band coverage. Uh, we've, we've worked a lot and uh, uh, contributed a lot to, to MIMO antenna systems in millimeter waves using DRAs, dielectric resonator antennas. Dielectric resonator antennas are very attractive at millimeter waves because they have very low loss compared to metallic based antennas. Okay, and, and we were, a uh, microbe was the first uh, to, to provide these kinds of uh, fixed tilted beam uh, MIMO uh, antenna systems uh, based on DRA arrays, and here we have two subarrays, each of four elements. Why do we need an array at millimeter waves? Because we want to combat the high losses, the free space path losses. So we compensate for that with having an array. 
does in an array, we can increase the gain and we can compensate for the loss. And here we can see that we can have a uh, very good bandwidth uh, within that band. In terms of antenna arrays, we've, 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 we've worked on a lot of examples. Um, uh, this is one recent example for a circularly polarized uh, a millimeter wave uh, antenna array that was optimized using the theory of characteristic modes. It is a dual band, as you can see over here, and we can do beam steering. This was a small prototype of a two by two because we didn't have uh, enough funding to, to have a, a more complicated array, but this was another complicated array that we developed a phased array uh, with 16 elements, as you can see here, and these are cavity backed patch antenna elements with very wide bandwidth. We're talking about four gigahertz to six, seven gigahertz of bandwidth, and we can do very good beam steering up to uh, plus minus uh, 24, five degrees. And this was actually developed using an LTCC process to have very high, uh, very low losses uh, um, at very high frequency. We also worked on structural based examples. So uh, we, we developed uh, um, um, lenses um, and this was one of the uh, very attractive lenses that we've worked on. This is a circular polarized lens with a single layer. Um, this was the first single layer circular polarized lens with um, uh, a unit elements on both sides that were optimized to, uh, first of all, give us uh, at least uh, a 12 dB, 10 to 12 dB of gain, as well as a circular polarization. So my student actually optimized the unit cell so that we can have circular, polariza circular polarization for uh, space applications or any other uh, application that needs CT. Um, we've worked a lot uh, with the, uh, the theory of characteristic modes, and we try to analyze and understand um, how can we utilize this technique to design multifunction uh, structures. So in here, for example, we are analyzing the effect of defective ground structures in a four uh, element MIMO antenna system in a handset. And then we're going to use uh, this defective ground structure as a radiator at a higher band. So we can look at the curves, we can massage, and we can analyze the effect of the various parameters. And we can look at the currents. This is current engineering. We're looking at the currents so that we can control the coupling so that we can control the radiation patterns so that we don't disturb those currents that are responsible for the radiation from each element. So the fundamental currents around the antenna should not be disturbed by the placement of these ground structures. Um, the capabilities of our labs are very, very uh, uh, good in a sense that we can measure the S parameters up to one terahertz and we can measure the radiation patterns up to 500 gigahertz. So we have a very, very attractive laboratory facility that is not managed by me uh, only. We are a, a group of professors who are actually uh, 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 supporting this lab uh, structure. I actually was the one who acquired this MIMO analyzer. In here, we can measure the MIMO parameters like the correlation coefficient, like the diversity gain, everything can be measured, not only simulated within this analyzer. Um, we have a clean room and we have more than 50 graduate students within our research center. Okay. So let's move to some of the drivers to what we are working on. So a lot of you guys, if you are doing antennas for wireless communications, then the need for the antennas is driven by technology and by demand of the market. So as you can see here, the evolution from the first generation wireless handsets to fifth generation wireless handset had actually had a huge impact on the way we are designing antennas. So the antennas in this kind of uh, handset are completely different than the ones that were used in this one, for example. Here we have so many antennas for so many different standards. That's why we want to unify. We want to reuse the aperture to support multibands and multifunctions. But of course, the market, uh, the, 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 the driving factor here is consumer need for data. So we need to develop more technologies to have more connectivity, to be able to have high speeds coming into our handsets so that we can do, uh, uh, you know, uh, having fun, doing games or tracking and doing some other uh, uh, functionalities. So when we look at the speeds, coming into your mobile phone, we're talking about rocket speeds nowadays in terms of, you know, the, um, the uh, very slow 
uh, text only based uh, services that uh, I remember we had back in the 90s. So the need for speed, as I said, this is a, it's market driven and uh, there is a, a, a huge uh, growth in the markets that are pushing us as antenna designers and researchers to come up with novel ideas to uh, support this market uh, and the drive of this market. So if we can look at the um, uh, number of machine to machine communications, the number of cell phones and tablets, they are actually taking the majority of the of the devices that are being uh, used around the world. And we're talking when we talk about 5G and 5G and beyond, we're talking about very smart uh, uh, machines talking to each other. And we're talking about 14 billion machine to machine communications or links uh, coming in the in the coming few years. So that will put a lot of demand on coming up with novel antenna systems and radio frequency front ends. Not to mention that we are living in a in a in a in an intelligent society. We are pushing a lot for connectivity everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, we want to connect our car, we want to connect to our appliances at home. Uh, already people have demonstrated, you know, putting putting uh, uh, sensor in your underwear so that we can monitor your heartbeat we can monitor other health conditions of the elderly especially so uh, the, the, the drive for technology is is, is going uh, in a fast pace that we need to actually provide uh, 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 solutions to all of these applications and use cases when we look at this uh, uh, very well known uh, 5g triangle as you can see there are three vertices that are driving the uh, um, the technology or the design. We have applications of massive connectivity, like the Internet of Things. We want or uh, 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 we want to have here um, thousands, tens of thousands, and millions of nodes connected together, but at a low data rates. So one example would be, for example, in a farm where you want to track all of your cattle or or, or animals or, or or environmental conditions. Um, another extreme here is low latency. This is the ultra high reliability communications which happen in, for example, self-driving cars. We want very small uh, response times. We don't want the car to think for a couple of seconds before it pushes its brake, because by that time, you know, you have made an accident and maybe you have endangered the people inside. So you need to do decisions in fractions of seconds so that you can maintain those critical uh, conditions of uh, self-driving vehicles. And then the third vertex here is what the majority of us are pushing for, which is ultra high, ultra wideband uh, or ultra mobile uh, uh, broadband connectivity, which is where we are talking about transferring gigabits per second uh, to mobile terminals. So for each of these use cases, the antenna structures are going to be different, um, even though, uh, and, and the frequency bands is going to be different. So uh, how do we integrate all of these functionalities together? Not to mention that. Within the cell phone industry, we are pushing for so many uh, different uh, parameters and metrics. So when we are talking about um, 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 an enhancement between the current generation and future generation wireless, connect, uh, wireless communications in terms of mobile wireless communications, we're going to see 10 times increase in terms of uh, 10 times increase in terms of connection density, 10 times decrease in terms of latency. 1,000 increase in traffic capacity and 10 times of experience throughput. So there's a 10 times increase in the speeds that you will be seeing. Of course, there are a lot of uh, vertices in this diagram, and all of these are direct enhancements when we go from 4G to 5G. I'm not going to go over all of them, but basically this shows you this uh, 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 green uh, um, um, shape over here, all these vertices in the green show you the enhancement between 4G and 5G. So, for example, if we're talking about area traffic capacity in 4G, we have 0.1 uh, megabit per second per meter square. In 5G, we're going to have 10. So, it's a hundred, it's a hundred times increase between these two vertices. Okay, and as you can see, you can you can map it to the other uh, directions. But this puts a lot of pressure and burden on us as antenna designers and radio frequency engineers to make these happen and satisfy these requirements. There's a lot of major change when we go to 
5G networks, not only from the mobile terminal side or the requirement side, but also from the base station side. The base station will actually uh, have a capability of um, sending directed dedicated beams to every single user. Um, 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 and this will increase the signal to noise ratio. This will improve the connectivity and the reliability as compared to 4G networks where we cover a sector. All the terminals within the sector will get the service. Anything outside of the sector will not get the service. Okay, but now with 5G, with what we call uh, active phased antenna arrays, um, we will or or massive MIMO, we're going to have actually dedicated beams that can reach out beyond the uh, uh, traditional cell sizes. Of course, we're not only talking about 5G. We need to consider what comes after that. And what comes after that is what we call beyond 5G, or some people call it 6G, not yet, it's not mature, but we're talking about seamless connectivity between various applications in space as well as on uh, on ground, okay? So we're gonna have massive connectivity between drones, between radars, between uh, uh, flying platforms. So you can imagine the push and the huge uh, 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 um, technological advancements that are required to make this happen. So we're talking about uh, if you are doing some research, uh, if you are now working on your PhD, some of the open areas that need a lot of attention are pervasive AI from a communications perspective. We're talking about radar, radar enabled contextual communications, we're talking about visible light communications, angular orbiter momentum, we're talking about wireless power transfer. Some of these techniques and technologies have already been uh, under heavy research in the past decade, but still we don't have a mature kind of um, reliable uh, technique that we can actually adopt in, in, in actual systems uh, so far. Here we're talking about also uh, uh, reflective um, uh, reflective uh, uh, services, uh, surfaces, so uh, RIS, um, uh, reflective impedance surfaces, we're talking about spatial domain multiplexing and so on and so forth. So a lot of technologies are popping up that need a lot of attention from us as researchers. I like this figure because it kind of highlights and shows you in a focused way where the directions are going. So in here, we can see that um, six out of 12 challenges for 6G consider RF engineering. Of course, terahertz or, 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 or uh, sub terahertz communications are still considered to be uh, uh, within our domain. Uh, actually, my group has started developing some um, some some structures, passive structures, and waveguides, directly waveguides, um, um, at the sub terahertz regime. We're talking about 150 gigahertz. We're talking about 320 gigahertz. So we're working on that as we speak. So because this is going to be an enabling technology for future terahertz communications, and these are for short ranges. Uh, terahertz will not go for long for long ranges like like microwaves because the signal loss is huge. But basically, for short communications where you have a, for example, a kiosk, uh, a machine, and you put your phone on it, and instantly in a second, you will transfer multiple gigabytes of movies, of, 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 of data, or, or, or whatever. And so there is developments in terms of 5G or 4G and MIMO. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of these for the sake of time, but the, uh, a lot of companies around the world are pushing very, uh, uh, heavily in, in, in coming up with novel solutions that will satisfy uh, 5G requirements. One of them is Qualcomm, as some of you might know. And Qualcomm has already developed a four by two uh, uh, phased antenna array within this chip that can only provide 800 megahertz of bandwidth. I'm gonna show an example at the end where we actually, in my group, have uh, we, we, we beat this number with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the concept of connected antenna arrays um, um, and, and we can do beam steering in a very efficient way as well. Um, and we occupy less than a quarter of this space that um, Qualcomm is, uh, is commercializing. But again, this is a commercial part that can fit in cell phones. Ours is just a proof of concept within the rim of a phone. I will show you the details as we go forward. Of course, a lot of company, uh, a lot of countries have already adopted 5G uh, towers uh, in Canada and in the US. We have that service as we speak. Um, I don't know about India, but I think you guys are going there as well. And maybe some of the cities are already deploying 5G based services. 
So we are uh, going in that direction very fast. So what are the enabling technologies for 5G? Basically, it's not only the antennas, it's not only the RF front end, it, it's a combination of technologies that we need to also uh, give credit to. So for example, um, 5G utilizes MIMO, multiple input, multiple output systems, and beamforming. So this technology was first introduced in 4G systems, okay? And it will, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, it will last forever. We will not get rid of MIMO in any future uh, uh, wireless standard. Of course, we are using advanced modulation encoding schemes. We're using multiple uh, advanced multiple access uh, techniques. We're using smaller cells for ultra densification with small device to device communication. So, for example, if you are um, um, three stories below the ground, then the signal from the tower definitely will not come to you. So, what happens here is that in 5G use cases, we can either have some smaller hotspots inside the building to cover you know, uh, garages that go 10 stories below the ground, or you can use a, a proximity uh, uh, kind of communication where a, 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 a close by device, a couple of stories above you can have a link with another device, can have a link with the tower. So this way your device will also act as a relay for the data of other people. Of course, the utilization of millimeter waves is extremely important in 5G because they provide us with very wide bandwidths and they uh, concept of massive MIMO. I'm going to touch on the three concepts of MIMO, millimeter waves, and massive MIMO. Okay. So, we're going to do one part to understand why is MIMO important. And it all goes back to this simple fundamental equation. So, this is the, the Shannon uh, uh, capacity equation where it says that the amount of data that you can send through the channel is a function of the is a function of the number of antennas at the RX side, at the receiver side, is a function of specific noise ratio, and is a function of the antennas on the transmit side, okay? Of course, and the channel conditions, okay? So the channel should support uh, having multiple streams that are not destroying one another, uh, and we can combine these constructively at the receiver. Um, the, the, the idea of MIMO actually uh, is more than uh, uh, 15 years old, if not 20 years old, but it started to show up in literature about 15 years ago. Uh, this, this was one of the initial studies that was done based on monopole antennas at the UCLA by the group of Professor Ramat Sami. And as you can see here, if we have multiple antennas that are widely separated, we're talking about a lambda separation between the antennas, okay, lambda separation, then we can have from four antennas at the transmit, four antennas at the receive, we can have, we can achieve the theoretical limit. The theoretical limit is this line, okay? And these are the scattered lines from the experiment. So we can achieve the theoretical limit if we have very nice separation. Now, of course, the theoretical limit of lower number of antenna elements or lower number of channels will decline. That's why we want more independent channels to get higher capacity. Now, if you start getting the antennas closer to one another, your capacity will start dropping. You will not achieve the theoretical limit. You will be dropping below it and significantly below it in this case, okay? And this means shows a this type of limit and a very high envelope correlation coefficient values, okay? Because the antennas are lambda over eight by lambda over eight uh, separated. And this gives us the fundamental framework of how we need to design our antennas. We need to decouple them in terms of the port parameters, we need to decouple them in terms of the radiation patterns. Of course, use cases for MIMO are endless, okay? Now, everything has MIMO, okay? All the 4G-based standards uh, for wireless NAN, for, for DSRC, even 5G, we are at least using two to four antennas in every handset. So, multi-band, multi-antenna element systems are essential to save the area and to utilize the volumes within the devices in a very efficient way. Now, in my antenna designs, to achieve higher channel capacity, there are two requirements. And as a, as a reviewer and as an editor and as an associate editor and as an editor of various journals, people still fall in the same trap 
of only looking at and improving the S parameters or the port isolation and ignoring the radiation patterns. This is not correct. The major misconception is that higher port isolation will provide lower envelope correlation coefficient. And this is not correct. Envelope correlation coefficients are based on the radiated patterns. Okay. And this formula is only valid for isotropic channels. You need to get the other long formula for, for more directive really favored channels. So pay attention. A lot of people are using these as parameter based equations because these are valid under certain conditions. There are three conditions that need to be satisfied. So pay attention. If you just only rely on these, your results will not be correct. So don't submit a paper with only doing uh, um, uh, envelope correlation coefficients for a minimum antenna system using the S parameter method alone. One simple example to prove this, we have actually showed this uh, more than five, six years ago. If you have a patch antenna system like this, two patches separated uh, by 14 millimeters, 5.8 gigahertz operation. If you look at the S parameter separation, they are already having good S parameter values. If if the if the coupling is below 15 dB, then that is considered acceptable. We look at the radiation patterns, okay, for port one and port two, and then compare the correlation coefficient using the far field method and the S parameters. There's a huge discrepancy between the two levels, and this is the point that I want to make sure that all researchers around the world are aware of this. This is a misconception. Please avoid it. Now, another technology that is widely used in 5G is actually massive mining. And massive mining has a lot of advantages, okay? And it can provide us with higher channel capacities. I'm not going to go over the details of the math, but basically massive MIMO, if implemented properly, it will improve the channel capacity. It will provide us with high energy efficiency. It will provide us with inexpensive low power components because we are having hundreds of antennas and separating the power between these antennas. So basically in the in the back end, we have radio frequency front ends. We're talking about power amplifiers. We're talking about low noise amplifiers. We're talking about mixers. The power ratings of these devices will be low per element, okay? Of course, the combination of the elements will give us a very high power, okay? But per element, it will be low. And these components are very cheap nowadays. And of course, it will be, give us a very good robustness against jamming because we have these dedicated beams for every user. So if a jammer comes from this side, for example, it will not affect anybody or this side, it will not affect anybody because these are very narrow beams uh, going to your device. Another advantage and technology that is needed in energy is millimeter waves. And in millimeter waves, we have two bands that have been adopted in the US, Canada, as well as abroad. Uh, in Europe, I think it also covers 26 gigahertz. In Asia, I'm not sure, uh, but basically um, the idea here is that the free space path loss in 28 gigahertz and 38 gigahertz is low, okay? And thus we can compensate for that loss with uh, uh, moderate uh, phased antenna arrays, like you know, eight elements, four elements would, would do the job, okay? And basically um, this will give us an extremely good coverage as well. So if we have two antennas with 15 dBi combined gain, then basically, uh, uh, especially from, um, especially, uh, uh, by the way, if, if you guys are typing anything in the chat, I will not be able to see it because I'm focusing on the, on the presentation. So maybe we can, we can answer some questions at the end. Um, so basically if we have 30 dBi of combined gain, uh, we can reach with millimeter waves up to 350 uh, meters away from the base station. So this is, this analysis or this study that was published back in 2013 showed the potential of using millimeter waves in 5G networks. And that is why nowadays we're using it because it will work. So three technologies that you need to keep in mind, MIMO, millimeter waves, and massive MIMO are critical in uh, 5G and beyond. Now, for 5G terminals, um, we have uh, worked on in the past, I would say, eight years or so, almost a decade, uh, on the concepts of multifunction integrated antennas, on the antenna and antenna concepts, as well as encapsulated antenna systems. So, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the use cases, the industry will not stop. 
we will always be looking for new innovative antenna designs for various use cases and applications. So if we look at your 5G enabled handset, um, um, usually you're gonna have at least, um, uh, yes, we, as I said, it's not only the antennas, signal processing, uh, uh, um, um, uh, multiplexing techniques, adaptive modulation and coding are extremely important component of the success of uh, uh, um, um, the communication link. But we're talking about now antennas and the RF uh, uh, front end, which is our concern. So if we look at a, a, a 5G enabled device, you can see that uh, we will have at least a four 4G antennas to support a four by four minimum. Uh, we're also considering about eight antenna elements extra to support the higher band of massive minimum. Uh, and we will have the millimeter wave arrays. People are talking about two to three locations of millimeter wave. So as you can see here, it's a very crowded real estate. If each one of them now is serving a purpose by itself, then this is a very crowded real estate. Now, can we combine some of these low band sub six gigahertz antennas together? The millimeter waves, uh, uh, can we combine it with a sub six gigahertz band? Let's see what we can do. I want to introduce you guys to the concept of connected antenna. If you have not seen this before, this is a concept that is not new, but it actually found some ears in the community back uh, about 10 years ago when Cavallo from the Netherlands and his uh, advisor Andrea Neto uh, investigated this problem uh, with uh, computational techniques nowadays uh, uh, and, and, and found out derived the closed form expressions of these connected antenna arrays of diapers. And what they found is that if we short these antennas, of course, this is the typical current distribution on an array of diapers, right? The, the current will actually look like this around the two antennas on the ground, on the, uh, not on the ground, uh, the, the, the current distribution on the element itself. This is a dipole, uh, let's say an isolated dipole. And we don't have any interaction between them other than port coupling and field coupling maybe. But here we short them together. And by shorting them, we're gonna have several advantages. One major advantage is the fact that we will have an impedance that is independent of frequency. It's only dependent on the scanning angle and the separation of the array elements. So this is a huge advantage that actually says that we can have wide bandwidths out of these structures if we design them properly. I'm not gonna go over the math. This is uh, uh, clear in in the paper of the of of. Uh, Can you let them buy that? I'm sorry. Uh, I request others to. Sir, one minute. I'll mute all of them. One minute. Yeah. So we're gonna continue. So basically, so basically, um, um, in this example, we have uh, an infinite ground plane with uh, shorted dipoles. Um, and 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 the clear. Take home message here is that the input impedance is independent of frequency. We took that and we provided the first uh, multifunction uh, connected antenna array based structures based on that idea. So, um, um, about seven years ago, uh, we actually worked on the first dual function connected antenna array where we used this um, 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 connected antenna array. As you can see, this is a difficult ground structure. This is a Digital ground structure that I showed at the very beginning with the theory of characteristic modes, we placed it in a proper position so that we can minimize the port coupling between these two elements. But then we said to ourselves, can we make it multifunction? Meaning it will be a defective ground structure and a planar connected array. So it will radiate at 12 gigahertz and it will block the coupling at two gigahertz. So it's a multifunction, single aperture uh, structure. And this was the beginning of a series of designs based on this idea. Multifunction structures that can work in one condition and in one band and have a totally different behavior at another band. So here we have the 4G minimum antennas on the corners. We have a 5G array 
um, um, uh, with this defect in the ground structure. Of course, somebody might say 5G, but this is 12 gigahertz. I would say this is a band that is currently investigated by Ericsson and Sony who have it as 5G, yes. And I knew this actually eight years ago. So we worked on it and, and basically we had this structure work in a very efficient and proper way. As you can see here, we had about uh, 580 megahertz of bandwidth at 12.5 gigahertz. We had 200 megahertz of bandwidth at 4G. So the specs were acceptable given uh, uh, the fabrication facility and the tools that we had. And we measured everything and we characterized it and we had some good results. So this, we would just want, this is a proof of concept. We just wanted to show that we can use this shared aperture multifunction capability uh, in real designs. We took it further and we said, okay, well, the previous design wasn't very efficient in terms of real estate because it took some area. So we said, okay, let's make it more efficient. Let's only utilize two slots, two rectangular slots, as you can see here, only on the periphery of a board. So this will not be disturbed by anything in the middle in terms of battery, electronics, whatever. And then we said, we will use only this to be our multifunction relay. So we said, we're gonna have a low frequency sub gigahertz uh, MIMO on top and bottom, and we will have millimeter wave based MIMO on the two sides. And this is what we did. This is the concept of connected antenna arrays as well. They are sharing the aperture, okay? And we have two separate arrays on the two opposite sides for 5G and two array, uh, 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 two elements MIMO on the top and the bottom sides for sub gigahertz. So this operated at several bands, 1.5 gigahertz, uh, uh, sub-6 gigahertz, we had several bands with bandwidths of 1.5, 1.3 gigahertz, and uh, uh, as well as uh, um, as well as uh, uh, a higher bandwidth at the higher bands. Over here, 5G, we had about 1.3 gigahertz of bandwidth at 17 gigahertz. Again, this is another potential 5G frequency. And we had multiple frequency bands with at least 124 megahertz of coverage at sub six gigahertz. Okay, of course, here we're taking the minus six dB bandwidth, which is a bit, which is possible for multiband antennas. We can go and lower this the uh, VSWR requirement to be one to three rather than one to two. So basically, we can go to minus six dB instead of minus ten dB because we have multiple bands and we cannot match very well at that uh, frequency, but this is an industry standard. So this is acceptable. And as you can see here, we can see the current distributions and how we can control uh, the location of these elements. We tested it, we measured it, and uh, the the the, uh, the results were acceptable. Of course, there's a lot of ripple here because we are not doing any enhancements to the structure itself. Now, we said, okay, the coupling between the terminals was a little, was a little bit high. So we added these, uh, resonators trapping elements here so that we can improve the port coupling. Okay, because again, this was a shared aperture structure. As you can see here, these uh, um, uh, resonators actually uh, uh, consumed the energy and reduced the coupling between the top and the bottom terminals, especially at the low bands. Now, the concept of this shared aperture, uh, we wanted to take it a little bit further. Um, we said, okay. We don't want to just use these uh, PCB board based uh, structures. We want to use the frame itself because a lot of antennas in 5G phones are using the frame of the of the of the phone. So we checked the literature about five years ago, uh, and and we noticed that a couple of studies only uh, showed multi-band um, shared aperture in rim or in metal based antenna systems. This was one of them. But this antenna actually showed two bands in the millimeter wave band. The challenge here is to have a millimeter wave band and a sub six gigahertz band. This is very challenging because of the very wide and large frequency ratio between the two bands. So if we look at this example, these guys showed some, some of these uh, results in two bands at millimeter waves with some beam scanning uh, uh, capability. But the problem here is that it was simulations only. So this appeared in a conference. Another uh, recent work uh, that came from Sweden uh, in 2022 actually showed uh, a prototype. But this prototype also showed 
a, a millimeter wave as well as a subsis gigahertz based uh, 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 design. But here, the main drawback of this design was the bandwidth covered at millimeter waves. It was a very uh, uh, narrow bandwidth. It was close to the Qualcomm IC. Okay. Not to mention that these antennas were placed on the corner so that they can take advantage of the physical radiation location. So this one covers here. This one covers here, but they claim that they can cover all space in their beam pattern, but that's not true because, first of all, their beam is fixed. It's just based on a switching mechanism. And per sector, they can only cover one beam. So I had one master student who I gave him the idea of having a shared aperture connected antenna array in the metal frame covering 28 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz. And we call this the cactus based or cactus shaped antenna. As you can see here, it's just this, it's very small. It's very small in terms of the aperture of the area. The current is confined around it. Okay. And we have half a slot size. This is the slot size, a regular slot size at sub, oh, at sub six gigahertz. It's about, um, um, Let me move this. I, I forgot the exact uh, space. Yeah, so it was 37 millimeters. This is the sub six gigahertz antenna at 3.5 gigahertz. And this was 17.8 millimeters for the millimeter wave array. Okay. Now, what we did, we actually did the analysis and we said we will short this one with the other one so that we can reduce the size. So this was cut in half and attached at the middle, and there is a reason for that, not to disturb the currents on both sides of these antenna elements. And then we optimized it, and as you can see here, we have four ports for beam steering for the millimeter wave array, and one port for the sub-6 gigahertz. And this was the final structure. So we put one array over here, another one over here, and two at the top and bottom that have only millimeter wave arrays only, so it's only a slot. And as you can see here, this size, is extremely small. It's 75% smaller in area compared to the Qualcomm chipset. Okay. A huge advantage, a huge improvement over what is in literature. We built it actually. It was not a simple build, but actually we built it. This is the PCB, a thin PCB, 0.25 milli, 0.13 or 0.25 millimeter uh, printed circuit board, low loss. And this is the, the back side. This is the front side. These are the lines. And we actually put a backing reflector on here so that we can isolate it from the inside of the of the phone. And as you can see here, we populated all the, ed uh, the three edges over here. We had a metal plate to hold the, 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 the ground. And then we actually connected the various lines. Um, uh, we connected the various lines um, in the test setup. And as you can see, it's extremely a small structure. And this was uh, a custom made setup, but then we proved that we can do beam steering and we can have very wide bandwidth. The bandwidth that we achieved here was more than two and a half gigahertz. Okay, so it's four times the bandwidth of the Qualcomm chipset. So this is a true uh, shared aperture based uh, 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 antenna system with MIMO capability because we have the arrays on both sides of the phone. The final concept that I want to touch upon before we close is the concept of encapsulating. So we said shared aperture, we are sharing the aperture, but encapsulation, we put one inside the other, okay? Complete encapsulation. And um, the idea that I, 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 I had was that, okay, for dielectric resonators, we can actually in, encapsulate an array within an element. And we were successful with that, with the mechanical engineering department, with a, a process called fused filament fabrication, where we actually fabricate the 3D printing but two different elements, two different materials. So we use different materials to build a, 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 an encapsulated antenna, as you can see here, with a lens, a dielectric lens to focus. And the idea here is to have a millimeter wave beam that can scan and a fixed sub six gigahertz beam that is fixed. And it can be in one. So we made this fabrication. And as you can see here, we played with the aspect ratio between the air holes and the material to play with the dielectric constant of the material. We had these five ports for beam switching. And as you can see here, down here, we were successful in the beam switching and having a scanning range that is plus minus 
I think 30 degrees or plus minus 35 degrees at 30 gigahertz with a bandwidth of 32%, a very large bandwidth that was achieved at millimeter waves compared to other uh, uh, designs in literature. So this, I mark it a true encapsulated base structure that was one of a kind uh, with beam switching capabilities. So wrapping up some of the future challenges that are still existing, this is a 5G radio architecture. So our focus in my group uh, is basically the multi antenna, multi function uh, 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 front ends. They are considering multi band receivers and um, down controllers, as well as the integration of energy harvesters and uh, wireless uh, uh, charging uh, capabilities. So all of this lies within the domain of radio frequency engineers. Um, some of the potential challenges that we are looking at, and you guys can also start looking at, and this is from my own personal views, is that we need to have active integration, miniaturized active antennas, extremely important in 5G and beyond. We are considering on-chip and on-package, in-package antenna array solutions to have miniaturization as well as uh, antenna array solutions for millimeter wave bands. Beamforming is vital. Don't submit any work at millimeter waves without beamforming capability. Um, testing and characterization is extremely important. You need to have the tools and access to labs. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fully open to collaboration as well. Um, um, CAD tools, you need to model your designs properly. For example, here, the students were modeling the connectors as part of their simulation model. You have to do that so that you can predict accurately what will happen to the S parameters and the radiation patterns because these connectors can affect your design when you build it, especially at millimeter waves. Health issues, uh huh. Somebody needs to look into that because it's very important. Now we have high power beams or relatively high power beams that are coming out of the phone. Make sure they are away from the body of the person and also considering beyond. Uh, conventional frequencies. So we are now going higher than 100 gigahertz in terms of antenna designs. So our quest and goal is towards ultimate integration between antennas, electronics, and algorithms. Of course, as uh, was mentioned at the beginning, there are two books that cover some of these topics. Um, this book has a lot of examples, even CST models and HFSS models and tutorials. So um, if you can get a soft copy or a hard copy, it might benefit you. And again, this work would have never been done without the amazing team that I had over the years. Um, a lot of uh, innovative uh, uh, antenna researchers and radio frequency gurus. Thank you very much for listening. And I think we have five minutes for questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sharabi, for a detailed discussion on shared aperture antennas. Uh, you have covered all the applications, like uh, starting from uh, MIMO antennas, then 5G millimeter wave lens antennas. Uh, thank you very much. It's a detailed uh, shared aperture antenna lecture. Thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, in, in the chat box, uh, there are a uh, few questions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, shall I read it out or can you? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. um, because I want to keep this, the slides on just in case if we want to go to the slides. So if you can read them, and I will address them uh, in the time in the time frame. Uh, yeah. So MIMO by itself or faced MIMO is not a proof against jamming. I am not clear what the question is. Uh, well, here is the catch. Um, you have to be careful uh, when you define this. Um, if I have a high power signal in my frequency band of operation, regardless of what you have, I will definitely raise the noise floor and I can saturate my receiver. Yes, I can jam, but, but the jammers are far away. And of course, they are usually uh, with high power. Um, if you have, for example, dedicated beams with high signal to noise ratios, uh, you know, you might combat jamming. Of course, I mean, it depends on the use case. Uh, uh, I cannot say that MIMO will will uh, is the solution against jamming. No, because even with MIMO, even with with even with a with a direct beam that is coming to your phone, I can jam if I have a higher, much higher power. It's, it, this is well known because you know it depends on what is coming into your receiver at that point in time. So if the jammer has higher power, it will jam you. Um, 
um, and, and, and nobody can help you. <laughs> Especially, uh, there are jammers that are used in some places. If you go inside the building, you will lose your signal right away. Why? Because of these jammers. So, yes, uh, um, it all depends. But in general, if we look at, let me go back to the slides quickly. If we look at the use case of massive MIMO, what we are saying here is that you will have a capability to reach out to users in a better way. So this is the conventional way. Under the same circumstances, this will be much better. Why? Because you're going to have higher signal to noise ratios. You will reach ranges that are larger than the coverage or the sectoral area of conventional networks. And you will have higher data rates. Now, if there is jamming, whether here or here, that depends on the jammer. I cannot, I cannot say that this is a solution against jamming. It's not. You're right. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, Madan Kumar Pandey has raised his hand. So let me unmute so that he can ask the questions. Um, one or two, one or two questions. One minute. Uh, Madan Kumar, can you ask the question? Okay, let me read it out. The signal processing algorithms uh, like uh, RD step or some other uh, algorithms can be used. Uh, that's what his question is. Yes, it depends. I mean, the, now we're talking about the receiver architecture. Um, uh, uh, my domain of research is not the receiver architecture or the algorithm, the communication, the communication side, the baseband processing. We're not doing baseband processing. Yes, um, there are a lot of algorithms in at baseband that are are used. Um, uh, for various uh, applications. So, yes, that will also uh, determine uh, how efficient your communication link and how fast it is. But, you know, uh, we, are, we, we, we are using. Uh, yes, it, it depends on it depends on the on. On, on, on the baseband processing you're adapting or that chipset that you are using in your phone is adapting. But yes, there are there are standards that are. Um, uh, being utilized for 5G and 4G, um, I'm not, I'm not, you know, up to date on what, what, what are the latest standards from the baseband processing side because that's not my domain of expertise. Okay, but so yes, then, uh, but yes, signal processing is a major factor. Yeah, thank you. And can you comment on this uh, substrates used that uh, micro frequencies for shared upper channels? Yes, um, it depends. Um, usually, we use low loss substrates. So we're talking about RO uh, 4350, uh, Rogers 4350, or uh, 5880. It depends. If we want a low loss, high dielectric constant substrate, okay, uh, then usually we use the 4, uh, 4350 uh, Rogers substrate. Let me see if we have it here uh, in one of the examples. These examples are using that substrate, I know, because it can give you uh, an obstinate R of about six. And that will help you miniaturize your antenna and have a smaller size. Um, maybe they are not mentioned here, but uh, some of our papers are in, uh, in yes, here, or, or uh, RO3003. This is another subsidy that we use as well. So basically, you, uh, these are in OJA. So this is these are open open access journals. Please check them out. Uh, you will see all the details. We're not, we, we want to disseminate knowledge. We want to share knowledge. This paper is also coming out soon. I think it was accepted uh, in the, the last month or something. So please check it out. Um, all the details are there. And yeah, for this one, you. for 3D printing, for 3D printing, we also choose low loss based uh, 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 filaments. It's called ABS 1200. I think we have one minute, maybe or less, uh, for one last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, the questions are done. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Puneet sir, we want to uh, say something. Yeah, thank you, Professor Muhammad. Thank you very much for joining us and providing a wonderful perspective on uh, antenna, in antenna, as well as shared aperture antenna, multifunction antenna. I think uh, a lot of good work is being done by you, your and your team. Really appreciate it, and definitely this uh, presentation might have helped all the attendees. Thank you very much yeah. for joining us.
Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and have a wonderful yeah. evening. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, once again, and uh, thank all the audience for joining us. And uh, yeah, I thank you. Can take a quick photo if yeah, yeah. for so, support purpose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I request all the attendees to switch on their video. Uh, just one minute. I'll not take more than. Uh, professor, you can remove your presentation so that uh, all can come in the. Yeah. Yes. I thank you. That. Yes, Mahesh, you can click a photo and then we can wind up. Yes, sir, I'm doing it. Yeah, I request others to switch on the video if possible. Yeah. Sir, can we get uh, the recorded session of uh, the presentation? The photo? Yes. Thank you. Then, Mahesh? Yeah, yes, sir. Done, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thank you.